Welcome to the Afrasia webinar series. So today's topic is a very interesting topic. We're going to talk about the reliable transition. Joining me today on this webinar, we have two experts in the field. So namely, Mr. Dr. Pericles Tivaios, who's a partner at True Note Partners, an independent consulting firm based out of London. Uh, Pericles has close to 20 years of experience in the financial services industry. And more importantly, he's a subject matter expert on the LIBOR transition. Pericles and his team have assisted and are currently assisting a number of banks across the jurisdiction on the LIBOR transition, especially when it comes to impact analysis and indication of this transition. Second member of our panel today is Mr. Jean-Éric Sozier, the partner of BLC Robert and Associates, with close to 20 years of experience in the field. Uh, he's currently heading the banking and finance team at BLC, and he engages regularly with banks and clients alike on a number of transactions, be it on the domestic side and on cross-border financing. Now, most of you would not know, but Jean-Éric also works together with the MBA working group on the LIBOR transition, assisting all the banks in Mauritius on the transition and the implications for the sector. As far as myself is concerned, I'm Kabir Ramburn, uh, business manager for the Treasury and Markets uh, team at Afrasia Bank. And I will take you through the webinar today as your moderator. So welcome, gentlemen. The LIBO transition is probably one of the most important events in recent times to disrupt the global financial markets. And it's safe to say that a lot of the global participants are still in the process of understanding the implications of the shift. Now, you have a number of governing bodies around the world who are busy putting on paper the various conventions with regards to the new rates. And more importantly, there are a number of works that has been carried out by the LMA and global associations on what is the proposed legal framework and the legal proposed, uh, proposed legal language with regards to the transition. Now, when you look at the LIBOR transition in layman terms, a lot of people can think that it's a technical matter. But the whole idea today of our webinar is precisely to demystify the concepts around the transition. So I'll get straight to the point. What is a LIBOR transition and why do we have the LIBOR transition and why do we have such implications for the financial markets? And I would like to direct my question to Pericles. Kabir, thank, thanks a lot and good afternoon everybody who is joining us. So let me start with your first question. Why the LIBOR transition? Well, a lot of you may have heard about the rigging scandal about 10 years ago. Uh, now, to be honest, that was just the trigger uh, for, for the reform. In reality, LIBOR rates, which are generally derived from an average of submissions by panel banks, are increasingly uh, based on markets that are less active, and therefore there's, they're more determined by expert judgment something that the Financial Stability Board, amongst other industry bodies and regulators, uh, believe that was not appropriate. Therefore, we've gone through a process uh, that started with the IOSCO principles published in 2013 in order to reform these financial markets. Now, you kind of have answered already the second part. Is why is it having such wide implications? Well, it is without a doubt one of the biggest challenges uh, that financial markets have experienced in generations, as you said. Why is that? Well. LIBOR is undoubtedly the most commonly used benchmark rate in international markets. And as of the beginning of the reform, uh, let's say around 2017, when the announcement was made, LIBOR was underpinned in excess of $350 trillion worth of transactions. So the significance of, of LIBOR and the difficulty of moving away from it cannot be understated. Okay, so plainly speaking, Pericles, what are the LIBOR rates being replaced by? We've heard a number of rates. Some members of, of our audience might not know what they're being replaced by. Right? So I would like to ask you, what are the replacement rates? Uh, some of the key timelines per currency, because different currencies have different benchmarks. And what are the challenges associated to the new rates? Yeah. So if we start, so at the moment we have five LIBOR currencies and seven fixings per currency. So in total we have 35 LIBOR rates, but let's simplify and just focus on the currencies for now. 
Effectively, the decision in following the IOSCO principles for the need to use actual observable transactions for the definition of financial benchmarks, local regulators have chosen uh, alternative reference rates that are risk-free and overnight in nature. Now, namely, which ones are those? For US dollar LIBOR, the replacement rate is SOFA. For sterling LIBOR is SONIA. For euro LIBOR is the euro SDR. For Swiss franc LIBOR is SARON. And for the Japanese yen LIBOR is TONA. Now, as of the 5th of March, we know that the vast majority of these rates will cease to be published at the end of this year. So there's not that much time left, uh, with the exception of US dollar LIBOR link contracts that are allowed to mature up until the 30th of June of 2023 using USD, USD LIBOR submissions that will continue from, from the panel banks. But it's really important to note here that these US dollar LIBOR rates will only be available for legacy contracts. So what this means is that any new instrument that is issued as of the beginning of 2022, whether it's euro denominated, sterling denominated, uh, dollar denominated, it will not be on, on LIBORs. The LIBORs will cease to be published or at the same time being to be unrepresentative. Now, the second part of your question was asking, why, what are the challenges? Why is this such a big thing? Well, what we need to understand, as I mentioned, is because LIBOR rates were expert judgment driven, well, the new RFRs, the risk-free replacement rates, are based on actual transactions, we have some structural and economic differences. Economically, LIBOR, because it's an interbank offer rate, by definition includes an interbank credit premium something that is not included in the risk-free rates. And risk-free always in quotation marks, right? If there's one thing we learned in 2008 is that there's no such thing as risk-free, but these rates are as close as we can get to that. So economically, LIBOR embeds a credit premium that the RFRs do not. Structurally, because RFRs are overnight rates, there's accrued in our ears, the main difference is that settlement interest is only known towards the end of the period. Now, as of recently, we've had a number of developments in terms of the term RFRs, that I'm pretty sure we're gonna to touch on uh, later within this conversation. Uh, but these term RFRs are solving some of these structural issues, but still economically, the challenges remain. And we can, at the moment, for example, observe the spread between LIBORs and the respective new term RFRs. Now, lastly, the main challenge that I would like Jean-Éric to, to comment on are also the legal challenges associated with that. So maybe uh, then I can hand over to Jean-Éric a little bit on the legal challenges uh, out of the transition. Yeah. So I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to transition to, uh, to Jean-Éric. One of the challenges is that we are seeing from a banking perspective are the legal challenges. So exactly, Jean-Éric, uh, what are the loans that are being affected? How are they being impacted from a legal perspective? Again, some of the key clients are and the type of lending uh, that are being affected, you know, communication versus multiple lenders, bilateral lending. So over to you. Thank you, Kabir, and thank you for uh, your, your contribution, Pericles. Um, so uh, if we were going to be looking at the concept of a loan, it's basically an act of borrowing. And as one can imagine, one of those key elements of these types of contracts is the element of interest. And uh, in relation to the way that you calculate interest is a variation of a material term of contract, whether common law jurisdiction or whether you're a civil law jurisdiction, that would be you having to move a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, as such, uh, from a legal perspective, there's a need for all lenders and borrowers to agree on to how on how to recalibrate their debts in order to ensure that there is an element of continuity of of consensus and agreement on uh, debts which have already been rolled out. Um, there also is impact on new loans, but we're going to touch on that further down the line. 
So the immediate impact insofar as the market is concerned is in relation to ensuring that parties agree as to how, depending on the kind of loan arrangement that they have, uh, are going to be transiting between now, from, from now on to the 31st of December, and how they are going to be tackling later transitions to the extent that we are looking at the final sunset date, which Pericles referred to earlier, i.e. the 30th of June, 2023. Um, if we were to, to step back and look at the history of things, um, it needs to be noted that this is not something that's just happening now. There's a whole buildup that led us to where we are right now. The first FCA announcement in relation to the eventual departure from LIBOR as we know it uh, dates all the way back to 2017. So there's been, you can imagine that there's been a lot of groundwork building up to where we currently are. And we are now sort of getting to the final phase of the termination of use of LIBOR as a benchmark. Um, so if we were to segregate uh, on a currency basis and on a timeline basis where we are now, what we need to take away is that come the, 21st, the 31st of December, a few US dollar LIBOR tenors will uh, be, be terminated. What we are going to be keeping on the dollar pricing all the way up to mid 2023 is US dollar one month, US dollar three months, and US dollar six months. And that's quite important to take away because uh, for a lot of the dollar debt, these tenors are the most important. So it's, it's important for the market to understand that uh, you know, we're not here as the horsemen of the apocalypse. We're not trying to put undue pressure on the market, uh, but there is a smooth transition through as we go through this through the process. But what they need to understand is also while there is that sunset provision, we need to be in a state of readiness. There is no more any room for wait and see. We need to be. Uh, engaged in what is commonly described uh, in the market as active transition. Uh, the, 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 the London market, when insofar as Sonia and GBP is concerned, they are a lot more aggressive and they are a lot more advanced than, for example, the dollar market. The Japanese market is also uh, quite ahead in terms of its state uh, of readiness. Uh, the Swiss franc also is quite is quite mature as to where it's uh, the manner in which it's handling the transition. Uh, but I guess that uh, the USD, um, the, the US dollar transition is the one that most people uh, on this webinar will be concerned with. Yeah. To answer your yeah. question uh, uh, as okay. to what, how uh, the, uh, the, the, the various types of debts are going to be affected, insofar as syndicated markets are concerned, typically the, 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 those books will be run on in more in those um, jurisdictions where the facility agents would have already reached a fairly mature stage of transition, transition, it wouldn't be uh, too, uh, we shouldn't be too alarmed about that. Uh, it's mostly for multiple lender scenarios and the bilateral scenario, scenarios that we should be focusing on. All right, at least on my side, what I can say is that when, when I plan, there's a lot of confusion around uh, what are the economic implications? So what are the interest computation methodologies that are going to be used with the new RFRs? How is LIBOR economically different? And how especially it impacts the client? Because there's a lot of talk about credit adjustment spread or adjustment spread, right? So maybe if I turn to Pericles, your expert, what are the economic implications of the new rates, in a sense, from a client's perspective, from an interest computation methodology perspective, what is the spread, the spread adjustments? I mean, it all seems a little bit alien at first. So maybe if we can have your views on that. Yes, absolutely. If I may, jean if you can please mute. I think there's some noise coming from that end. Hopefully we'll, we'll address some of... Right, I mean, this, this question, Kabir, could, could take quite some time to respond to, but let's try to get to the main points. We've already discussed that economically and structurally liables are different from the RFRs. This is primarily because the new rates are in arrears. Practically, 
we only know last day's rate the following morning. So this is a huge departure from where we were before. Now, we need to, when we start trying to understand the impact of the transition, it's very important to separate this between the derivative uh, book and the loan book. From a derivative book, and again, overly simplifying, we can assume that the transition is not really an issue. Derivatives markets have been on have been operating on in arrears rates for quite some time. Uh, in addition, from a derivatives perspective, is that the International Securities and Derivatives Association has come up with some umbrella agreements, also known as a protocol, which address what happens to these LIBOR rates upon transition. Where things are a little bit more complex because they're more novel, they're, it's new concepts that we need to grasp with. And you mentioned around computational methodology conventions is loans. Where now having to deal with the inner arrears nature uh, of these rates, we have to come up with a number of different ways or conventions as is technically known for calculating interest accruals. Now, a lot of the people in the audience may have heard and may be unfortunately getting confused by concepts such as simple interest or compound interest, with observation shift or without observation shift, and so on. In all honesty, I would like to say, uh, and please take a little bit of a pinch of salt, but it's actually closely to being the case, there's very little differences between these different conventions. What's really different is the fact that we're looking at rates in arrears. Now, whether we're calculating interest on a simple or on a compound basis, especially at low interest rate environments, makes very little difference. Whether we are applying an observation shift or not, again, with the exception of some weeks where there's a public holiday intervening, the impact is mostly zero around that. So what this means is that actually where we need to focus on is the aspects that have to do, as we said, with operational uh, readiness, so we need now to update our systems to be able to handle these conventions. And again, it, these conventions are not rocket science. You can program them in, but systems are, are big living creatures. They have a life of their own. It's not as simple as going and changing a couple of levers inside and it does the new calculation. And obviously, uh, where uh, experts like Jean Eric are absolutely essential is we also need to address the legal documentation uh, that is covering these aspects. Now, as part of the legal uh, process that we are following with the clients comes aspects like the credit adjustment spread that you mentioned. And again, let, let's take a step back. What is the objective of the credit adjustment spread? Well, because LIBOS and RFRs are not economically equivalent, we need some sort of adjustment that can minimize the differences uh, for liable contracts that are falling back into these rates. We said earlier at the very beginning that LIBORs embed an interbank premium, something that is not uh, available within, um, uh, within the RFI universe. And a credit adjustment spread is a mechanism for minimizing or for attempting to minimize that, that differential. Now, again, if we split between derivatives and loans, from a derivatives point of view, we have a clear indication of what these credit adjustment spreads are going to be. They have been published by ESDA. The methodology has been approved and the, the the rates were fixed again on the 5th of March this year. Now, what we need to keep in mind is that even though these CA, these, these adjustment spreads were determined by ESDA, which is a derivatives association, both the ARC, which is the regulatory body responsible for the transition in the United States, as well as the UK RFR working group and the ECB, the Financial Stability Board as well a month earlier, they have endorsed these CAS, these adjustment spreads, also for use of loans. So we, we're expecting that based on this strong regulatory guidance that it's going to be the, the adjustment spread of preference in a lot of transactions. Having said that, all guidance that has come out of regulators here is voluntary. So it's only normal that we can also expect uh, some, uh, some deviations out of that. The last point I want to make here is just that all the concept of the credit adjustment spread is only relevant during the transition period. In all honesty, the hardest aspect of the, of the transition, the, the hardest challenge is the period until we are on to the new rates. So from now until the end of the year for most of the currencies and from now until June 2023 uh, for US dollar LIBOR. After that, all these con concepts will, let's say, evaporate. The, the CAS concept, not the conventions. The conventions are here to stay. Uh, and that's what we, uh, what we need to, to, 
to address. Now, if I remember well, your last question was, what does, how does it impact the client? So I've already mentioned that system changes is one thing. And again, I would prefer that the expert here in the panel, uh, Jean-Éric, can talk to us about the contract amendments that are necessary as part of the process. All right. So if I understand correctly, Pericles, when we're talking about in arrears versus what we have now, kind of like it, the client at the moment, he knows exactly how much interest he needs to pay in three months or in one month or in six months. With the arrears methodology, there's essentially going to be a fixing on a daily basis, which takes a five day look back. So the client is not really aware at the onset, what interest he due in a month or in three months or in six months. And it's only at the end of that interest period that we will understand and we'll know exactly how much we to the bank, for example, in terms of, uh, in terms of the interest computation. So that's, that's my understanding of it. Yes, and you're exactly right. Again, I mean, this is one of the highest areas of concern, this lack of certainty about future payments. But I want to put it in context that even when we're using a three-month LIBOR fixing, we still don't know what we're going to pay six months from now, right? So all we've done is we've shortened the window of uncertainty, but I just try to highlight to, to all these concerned people I talk to, and I say, oh, but I would not know what my interest uh, settlement is going to be. Well, actually, even today, we don't really know. We may not for three months. We may not for six months if we use the 180-day LIBOR. But ultimately, for long-term loans, we still depend on the movements of interest rates. The benefit of in arrears conventions is that they're a lot smoother uh, than LIBOR and obviously a lot more reliable. So there are some downsides, but there are also some benefits. But again, in terms of the downsides, some of them are being addressed by the term RFRs. Okay, I'll get to the term RFRs in a bit. Now, you mentioned about the legal implications, right? So... Jean-Éric, in your experience, what are the typical items for discussion from a client's perspective? So I'm a client. I have a contract which is libel linked, right? I know it's going to transition. So when it comes to either amending the contract or repapering the existing loan agreement, whatever what, what we call the fallback language, right? How to approach that? How how do, do we approach it from a client's perspective? Right. Yes. How do you approach them? And, and I'd like to split the question a little bit in three parts. So, for example, the first part would be the existing contracts that we have, right, that are already papered, that have been conducted, that have been done in the past, right? Your legacy book, if I may call it that way. Uh, what does a client look? In this, the second part of the question is, what does a client look for for contracts that are being papered between now? And let's say the end of the year, which is the hard stop for the LIBOR. And what are the implications next year once LIBOR is not there or LIBOR, LIBOR cannot be in use? Okay, very good. So starting with your first question, i.e. what is the approach that we are supposed to be taking for legacy contracts? Um, I think that it looking from looking at the big picture shift from a distance, it may seem that it's a, it's a phenomenal piece of work that all the banks have to do and that all the borrowers have to do, i.e. that we're gonna to have to read document mountains and mountains worth of loan documents. But it's quite important that we understand something and it, that, it's that transiting from one interest benchmark to another is not a renegotiation of a deal. And it's ma it really matters that both the lending community as well as borrowers really understand that for as long as we are focused and efficient on what we should be achieving, uh, it's actually not as complicated as that. So we, we would need to take stock of a number of uh, moving pieces. We would firstly need to understand as lenders what it is that our system would be doing by reference to the, the risk-free rates, which we, which we would be using as reference points for repricing and understanding clearly uh, um, that this is not a renegotiation and this is what my system is offering and this is my treasury position and this is how I'm unflowing back to the debt market. 
So that's from the lender side. Now, if I was a client, I would probably take into account the fact that there are conventions out there, as referred to Pericles earlier in his uh, in his earlier contribution. So there is an element of uh, market standardization which is out there, but we probably also need to factor in that each deal, to a certain degree at least, stands on its own head. And in that sense, there's an element of uniqueness uh, that we have to address on a loan by loan basis. So if I am a borrower, and I'm stepping into the Afrasia boardroom and I'm about to negotiate my paperwork for transiting an existing loan from one interest benchmark to the other, I would try to the extent as possible to keep in line the notion of an interest period. There's a, there's a, a number of, of, of uh, elements that I need to draw out of those discussions. When do my interest periods start? How is it benchmark? How effective is my look back? In other words, how far back am I looking uh, in terms of picking up the relevant rates? Uh, at what point in time will I know uh, as from when my interest is being accrued? Or more importantly, when do I have contractual certainty as to how much interest I'm supposed to be paying and what is my payment date? In other words, how much time do I have as a borrower uh, uh, to ensure that I can practically discharge myself of my debt servicing obligations. Uh, it also matters, uh, there are some other parameters that I would want to keep in mind, i.e. making sure that, uh, you know, my if I have provided security and I have security providers involved in my transaction, but they are kept aware of the fact that the manner in which my interest is being computed is evolving, because more often than not, their consent will also be required in order to, to get my updated debt documentation approved. Uh, I would also need to factor in my internal corporate sensitivities. For example, if I'm a listed company or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever uh, internal uh, requirements, for example, shareholder approvals or board approvals and so on and so forth, the level of materiality of debt that I'm about to renegotiate may trigger internal sensitivities that I also want to try to anticipate on and try to 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 tick uh, ensure that I internally can tick through the relevant boxes as I engage through this transition process. Uh, so there are there are a number of of uh, items that I would need to check. So the loan documentation, the recalibration in itself, third parties involved and my own internal uh, approval process. These are the, as far as I'm concerned these are the three main areas where a borrower would need to, to put his, uh, in relation to which borrower we need to put on his uh, thinking cap. Um, so uh, in relation to uh, the, how much interest am I going to, 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 to pay, the default setting is that there should not be a material change, although, because, the credit adjustment spread referred to by Pericles earlier is meant to address that, but we need to bear in mind the fact that this is an attempt to achieve economic balance. It's just an attempt. There's no absolute certainty, uh, and no one can give an absolute guarantee that a lender's circumstances will transit in a manner that there will be zero economic shift. So, uh, but, but the, the ambition is to achieve that. Um, okay. No, it does address uh, what 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 I I picked up from your conversation here is that there are conventions, yes, as Perry Chris explained, but they are not cast in stone. We should not be bound by conventions. That's what you're saying. And the second thing that I'm, the second thing that I'm picking up as well is although the transition tries to achieve uh, economic parity, if I can call it that way. It, in some cases, given the credit adjustment spreads that are already fixed in the market, in some cases, it will not achieve economic parity, whether it is from a bank's perspective or from a client's perspective. And this is just something that we may have to live with it, right? Quite right, yeah, pretty much. So, Pericles, you, you, you touched on something before, uh, the term, term RFR, right? So there's been there's been a landmark 
sort of announcement, if I can call it that way, from the ARC a few weeks ago, talking about the concept of term chauffeur, which in a sense, what I've read and what everybody's reading is something that is, is the closest sort of alternative to the USD LIBOR as we know it, because it's, it embeds a term element. And I just want to tell the audience, term so far applies only to US dollar, right? It does not apply to any other, the current, any other currency. So I'd like to split the question in two. So what is term so far or the term rate? And can it simplify the transitions for the banks as well as the clients alike? So it eliminates the whole concept of compounding in arrears, which can be difficult to grasp, right? So that question is for Pericles and for Jean-Éric, from a legal perspective, would the legal community welcome the launch of a, of a term sofa rate for the US dollar or even term rates for uh, any other currencies? We heard about the term Sonia as well. I'm not sure how many transactions have been done on, on, on these rates, but from a legal perspective, would you, would you welcome this, uh, these new rates, the term elements? Shall I start? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Okay. Well, allow me to indulge a little bit into a technicality. So term, term rates or term RFRs is the market's best estimate of the path of the overnight RFRs. Let's, let's understand it a little bit like this. And why is this an important technicality to start with? Unlike liable rates that were one of the 16 traders sitting in London, uh, estimates of where the rates are going to go. Now we're looking at the markets, uh, basically futures and interest rate swaps predictions of where these RFRs are going to go. Now this is important because your question was, how close are we coming to, let's call it LIBOR equivalents? And structurally, term RFRs are quite similar, but economically they're not. And then there's also some operational estimates. But let's take think, steps. One at a time. So structurally, at least at the moment, we do have a one month, a three month, and a six month term so far. Twelve months term so far is also expected to be published at some point during this year. So that means that just like we had the three month LIBOR, we can choose from the beginning to reference term three month term so far, and then at least we have this certainty of interest payments over the following ninety days. So that's that's definitely beneficial. From a, from a treasury management uh, point of view, we know what we're gonna have, what interest is gonna be due at the end of this period, barring any unexpected uh, circumstances. Now, this is so, and obviously, all these conventions that we mentioned earlier, the compound in the inner areas and the observation shifts are also not relevant anymore because the the accrual of interest on these term rates is performed the same way as um, as it was done for libraries. Now, th th this was the good news. And let's now come to the not so good news about this. Number one, as I said, economically, these term RFRs are not the same as LIBOR. Because again, even though they may include a term component to them, the, it's actually, uh, no, even though they may have term fixings, they still do not include an interbank premium neither really a term liquidity premium. The reason being because I said it's the market's best estimate of what the overnight rates are going to be over a period in the future, right? So again, we having a term RFR that has a different quantum than the LIBOR rate. And this is something that we need to understand as financial institutions from a pricing perspective, and also as clients in terms of understanding that the rates we're going to get moving forward, they may appear to be different, but that's simply because to reflect the, the differences in the benchmark rate. Now, the second, let's say, not so good point, but very important to keep in mind about these term RFRs, is that the use is intentionally quite limited. So from a term, term Sonia has been the first RFR that was issued in January this year. And the Bank of England has given very limited a number a very limited number of use cases where terms on it can be used, primarily trade finance, some small to medium market loans, uh, Islamic finance, more or less that. The ARC on the 29th of July, when they made their own announcement, they similarly limited the use cases for terms so far, not as much as the, as the Bank of England, but still 
even even though we say well there's, there's this benefit of the term fixings with these rates it does not mean that we can use them in absolutely every transaction right at least to the extent that we're bound by the prescriptions coming out of these respective regulatory bodies uh, the use of these term rates is going to be relatively limited and we're going to have to work with you we can use them in some cases but we cannot uh, use them uh, all the time so i guess this is this is the summary about term rates what they are what is their similarity with with LIBOR, well, the term fixings, and what are the differences? Economically, they're different, but also their scope of application is quite limited com as compared to LIBOR, that there was pretty much no limitation on its use. And Tarek? Yes, so uh, how would the legal community uh, react to the introduction of, uh, of term rates? I can already tell you how the banking community reacted when they heard about uh, about uh, SOFA being announced as a, as a term rate. And uh, when the US announced just a couple of months ago that they were going to be following suit from what was happening uh, in London, i.e. announcing forward-looking rates, bankers were extremely happy to hear about this, thinking, oh, maybe we won't have to go through the pain of transiting through a look-back model and compounding and doing all of that mathematical headache and we can just jump you know take a shortcut and jump straight into uh forward-looking dollar rates at least that was the reaction of the community so at the risk of raining on you know all the bankers who may be um on, in the webinar it's actually not as straightforward as that firstly the, the these term rates come with limited uh, restricted use as pericles announced earlier whether it be gbp or us dollar there's only so much room that we have to use these uh, forward-looking rates as a benchmark for, for accrual of debt servicing costs, computation of interest. Also, we need to try to put things in context. You know, we are not where we are today in you know, third quarter 2021 as a matter of luck. There's been a massive amount of intellectual effort that has been made in order for us to gradually get ourselves in a state of readiness and embrace uh, compounded rates, compounded RFRs. Uh, there's been a lot of coding that has been done. Solution providers have been busy working with banks to, to gradually upgrade banking systems to, to map themselves on the new methodologies. The relatively recent announcement of term risk-free rates, coupled with the intended limited use of these new debt benchmarks have it that it's probably uh, too early for bankers or borrowers to start assuming that the, you know, that the rolling out of these rates will be done in a manner that firstly their banks will, will have in place the system that it takes to pick them up and use them in the same manner as uh, LIBOR use, is currently being used. That's number one. Number two, uh, the debt market community, especially at the level of the LMA, has been doing a lot of work. Uh, market participants have been contributing for the development of various forms of agreements which allow us to transit from a, an interest methodology to another. Due to the relatively recent announcement of these forward-looking dollar rates, it's, you know, none of that groundwork has been done. We don't know exactly what the transition documentation will be looking like. And it's extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely that this will be done between now and the 31st of December of this year. So uh, I, th I think we need, to take, uh, we need to take a dose of reality of where we are. We need to take a dose of reality of what legal guidance we are getting from the, the, the regulators worldwide, including uh, the, the, the Bank of Mauritius that has set a calendar in relation to the, the, the expected state of readiness that, uh, that banks should be in to transit from LIBOR as it is to a compounded model. I think I, think I, I echo both of what, both you guys, whatever you're saying, because in part of my day job is to talk with other banks as well worldwide. And when the announce was, announcement was made, we engaged with a number of our banks, especially on the derivatives market, to sort of understand what is their take on terms of the answer was 
pretty blunt. They couldn't care less because of the liquidity in the market. They would like to see liquidity ramp up on what we know right now, as in SOFA or SONIA. And it's only next year, probably towards the end of next year, when they assess the transition and where they are, that's when they will start providing pricing on term SOFA or term rates. Now, you touched on uh, on the Mauritian market, Jean-Eric. So you are part of the MBA working group. Uh, so just for the sake of our audience, and I'm also conscious of time here because I would like to take a few Q&As Q towards the end. We're receiving a few questions on the chat box. Uh, can you provide a little bit of an update of, what, of what's going on on the local market? Yeah, so uh, I would say that Mauritius was... Uh, well, when we started the initiatives of market awareness sometime last year, and uh, some people had actually never even heard of the idea of landlord uh, libel transiting. So it is fair to say that Mauritius is a bit, was a bit of a slow mover as compared to the rest of the financing markets. But things have pretty much picked up uh, uh, since. And there's been a lot of movement since the uh, beginning of this year. And despite uh, lockdown and everything, things have kept on progressing fairly well. Different banks, especially global banks, are probably more advanced in their state of readiness because of the globality of the manner in which uh, you know their, their, their head office have been driving the process. Local and regional banks uh, a little bit lagging behind, uh, but that is not to say that work has not been done. Uh, the central bank, as I said earlier, has got a calendar in place. My personal take is that. Uh, quite a few of the local licenses will not be in a position to meet the expectations of these guidance. And I stress here guidance, not guidelines. They're, they're, they could be read as being less binding than actual legal requirements. Uh, so my guess is that we would be going through a bit of a buggy transition phase between, between beginning of next year going, but that should smooth out uh, over the next uh, couple of quarters as we get into, we walk through 2022. Okay, and I would just like to provide the audience a little bit of one, what we're doing at a Fraser Bank. Now we, like any bank, we're focusing our, on our, our work on, on three major work streams, right? The first one is the communication angle, second one is the legal, legal angle, and the third one is, I would say, operational readiness. But that's mostly internal to the bank. So on the communication side, we've been quite active. Uh, we've communicated quite early with our clients we have a landing page, which I invite everyone on this webinar to uh, to go and visit, which has a comprehensive FAQs. And we also started uh, engaging with specific clients, or I would say client hearing, which uh, where, where we feel that we could have value in the transition, whether it is with, uh, with a Fraser Bank or if they have contracts with uh, other banks as well. Second part that we're doing is we are working with a number of providers to uh, on legal remediation. So the only thing I can I can say is uh, to clients is to sort of you know get ready. We are going to partner you on this journey because it's not easy for everyone. It's not easy for the banks. It's not easy for the clients. But we are here to assist and we are here to uh, to accompany you in the journey of transition. So. That sort of brings us to the end of uh, our discussion. I would like to take a few questions. So I'll start off with uh, with one question, and maybe I can address it to Pericles, and Jean-Éric, feel free to chip in, all right? So we, we had a question on loan breakage costs. So it said loan breakage costs are very often linked to LIBOR, what we've seen in, in current contracts. What will be the implications of the new interest convention on breakage cost computation methodologies? Uh, I like technical questions, so with, uh, there's a little bit of echo, I think, again. Oh, that's fine. That's perfect. Um, we need to keep in mind that loan breakage fees is something that is outside the scope of the pure interest rate transition, just to start with, right? So traditionally, we're using LIBOR to apply a, let's say, a prepayment fee or any other type of fee just because it was there and was convenient. The... The transition itself is interested in the reference benchmarks that I use for pricing, but obviously if we're using any benchmark 
for financial reasons, we need to make sure that we use the ones that are available. We see the LMA within their the recommended forms that they have published over the last few months, they're giving a number of options in terms of how breakage costs are going uh, to be accounted for. Whether, and the options, simply, simplistically speaking, that my banks can opt for is some sort of administrative fee, or they can tie now the that uh, that fee as a on the new RFR benchmarks. So, kind of a lengthy answer to say, well, because LIBOR is going to disappear, whether at the end of this year for most currencies or in June 2020, July 2023 for US dollar, if we have any breakage fees that are linked to LIBOR, we would have to reconsider that as well, simply because there will not be a LIBOR rate available for us to pick up how we deal with it, whether it's going to be some fixed administrative fee, some fixed other fixed percentage amount, or one of the alternative reference benchmarks. Uh, that's something that each bank can decide from a policy perspective. And obviously for contracts that are falling back, it has to be renegotiated and embedded into the into the documents. Okay. Okay. Jairik, do you have anything to add on that? Have you, have you had, have you had uh, any specific queries with regards to breakage costs when you're when you're looking at agreements? No, uh, uh, our, our focus has been primarily geared towards the actual repricing as opposed to the subtleties which were referred to. Uh, but if I was going to be chipping in, I would say that, well, what are we trying to achieve when we are hitting the topic of breakage? It's basically we're trying to compensate the bank against the circumstances of uh, the early premature repayment of an element of a debt. So uh, while I agree that uh, there, there is an issue because we previously had an objective benchmark which we could use to figure out what the amount of that compensation should be. So I don't know in terms of individual banks whether using credit adjustment spread methodology we could run a forecast in terms of what could have been earned at a set rate and try to find a way of figuring out the, the, the loss of revenue from the bank resulting out of that. But I would imagine that could be very tricky and that would be getting quite deep into the individual circumstances of banks and figuring out uh, how they are raising their own capital for onloading with, uh, with, uh, against a specific borrower. So there's probably no one-size-fits-all answer to that. We would probably want to have to stay conceptual first before we get into the specifics of that bank, of its balance sheet, and its own ability to raise capital and then figure out the, the difference uh, and from there deduct the actual compens eligible compensation for breakage. Okay. Great. I'll move on to the second question that we got. Um, so I'll just read it out. So USD one month, three months and six months LIBOR are the benchmark rates with the highest volumes of underlying transactions. Since new transactions will be will no longer reference these benchmarks as from the 1st of January 2022, what are your views on the representativeness and publication of these benchmark rates up to the hard de deadline of 30th of June 2023? And that's only for the dollar side. Again, who wants to go on this one? We're smiling at each other. This is such an interesting, <laughs> this is such an interesting question. I, I will give the regulatory, the standard regulatory response, which is probably the best that we all have. Uh, as of the 5th of March announcement, we do have an expectation that rates, US dollar, the, the US dollar tenor fixings that will continue to be published until the 30th of June 2023 are going to be deemed representative. Um, in other words, there seems to be a very low probability for a pre-cessation event to occur, a pre-cessation announcement to occur between now and then. Having said that, uh, you know, there's always an element of uncertainty about the future. I don't want any one of us to, to, to take something as granted, but the, the guidance we're getting from the regulators is that since the 5th of March announcement, we can with a better probability assume that until the, the, the hard end date that uh, these rates will remain representative despite very correctly point the absence of liquidity which uh, to be honest liquidity has been very low in the underlying markets for LIBOR for quite some time now 
So we've been made relying on on expert judgment. We will continue to rely on expert judgment for another eighteen months. My my contribution it goes along with the same lines. I mean, you you always try to hope for the best, but kind of prepare for the worst. And uh, we also want to try to remember that there is regulatory incentives different from regulators for people to get involved in active transition as opposed to waiting for the 11th hour to get our debts reprised. So if we do want to rely and assume that you know there won't be uh, any cessation or declaration of non-representativeness of those free dollar tenors, my best recommendation for lender to the lenders and borrowers is to at least, if you don't want to transit immediately, have at least hardwired documentation in place and ensure that you agree as to what the triggers could be. And your trigger in that case, to cover that scenario, would be such either uh, the absolute ter an early termination of any of those three uh, dollar tenors, depending on what kind of the deal we're looking at. Um, and also, uh, you know, a suspensive kind of mechanism whereby any declaration of non representativeness could be considered as a condition for switching uh, from your current LIBOR screen into a preset hardwired methodology already linking us back to RFRs. So there are ways that we can try to anticipate for a premature termination of those tenors as well despite the unlikely event of that happening. All right, very interesting. Uh, another question that we have here is, do we need to include a credit adjustment spread for pricing a new SOFA-linked transaction, not a legacy loan, a new SOFA-linked loan, assuming that we use term SOFA? So, very good. Uh, sure, I, I can take the top, and I'll, I'll use the language that Jean-Éric used earlier. Right. We need to be careful when we're thinking about conventions that these are guidelines, these are not prescriptions. Right. So what we're saying now is not a principle, but it's more, I'll try to give a little bit of context in terms of how the market thinks of evolving. Now, I like the question that it makes it very clear. We're talking about new transactions, right? So uh, we not legacy loans. From a pure pricing perspective that we offer to the client, if we are a bank or that the client receives, the market seems to converging towards a view that the CAS is not going to be something visible, right? So effectively, if I come to Afrasia uh, at the beginning of next year and I would like a, a some Euro loan or a Sterling loan, I would be told, all right, no problem. You will pay as Sonia plus X. Um, so it's unlikely, and again, I repeat, this is where market conventions are developing. This is no hard fact, neither uh, the, the response of based on any set document that says those shall do X. But it is highly unlikely that the CAS will be explicitly uh, referenced in new contracts, whether they're including the base, the referencing terms so far or so far in areas or any other uh, any other. Now, what is important, though, of course, as a as a bank that is pricing, is some sort of implicit CAS will have to be uh, calculated as part of the term liquidity premium methodology. But this is this is let's say a detail for the treasury departments within the banks. I would expect that most uh, pricing will be RFR plus a margin, and that margin will also include some of the components of that in in in, in, in switch loans are included in the CAS. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that because the idea for CES is to help us uh, is one of the levers to aim at achieving economic parity. But once we've cleared that uh, that stage, it's more likely than not that this is the way the markets are going to go in terms of pricing of uh, green loans. Now, this is my understanding as well uh, that you know the CES, like you said, you know, it, it caters for legacy transactions and new transactions are probably going to be RFRs, be it overnight or term, plus a client margin or a margin per se. The CES will disappear over time once everything has either, once all legacy transactions have either matured or 
uh, transition. Now, another question as well. I'm just being conscious of time. We have uh, two, three minutes remaining. So I'll take two more questions. So the next question is, should all borrowers in Mauritius get in touch with their bank to evaluate the impact on the interest payments? So maybe Jean-Éric, uh, maybe you can take that one. Well, yeah, uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the first, the, the hidden question is, should all lenders be actually reaching out to the borrowers? Because that's actually where you would expect the ignition to start. Uh, if you as a borrower have to reach out and knock on the door of your lender, then uh, maybe they are a little bit late in terms of the, uh, the awareness, the awareness campaign. But yeah, I mean, if you've got massive exposures and especially if you've got multi-currency exposures, because that's even trickier to manage because here you're going to have to juggle multiple risk-free rates simultaneously. And what we need to remember is that different financial markets are at different stages in terms of the implementation of risk-free rates with some GDP, for example, being more ahead of others like USD. So, uh, so yes, if you want to have if you've got any queries and uh, if you, you want to achieve certainty as to how contractually your documentation is gonna move, uh, uh, it's not, not to mention that we need to remember that you have your own internal consents to manage, having to get the relevant uh, finance document participants to sign off. The earlier you do, the, you get involved in this, the better. We are already about to get into Q4, we are clearing Q3 and the milestoning of what you are supposed, the state of readiness you're meant to be at at this stage is relatively high. So yeah, by all means, give your relationship manager a call or your head of corporate uh, with your banks, uh, uh, with your, your, your banks, assuming you're dealing with more than uh, one bank. And yeah, by all means, get your loan documentation out, get them ready and have some visibility as to how you're going to be transiting from one uh, debt pricing model to the other. Right. At least, at least on my side, what I can say is, I would imagine that the onus would would be on the financial institution to engage the conversation, but it's a two-way traffic because, again, I, I would see the financial institution being as a partner, so you sort of handhold, I would say, uh, your client to that journey because we are the we are the technical experts. We can't expect. Uh, uh, clients to be technical experts in in the transition, so it's a two way street. But the owners, would, I would say, would always have to remain with the financial institution to, to sort of engage. So, I think a final question, just in the interest of time, and it's quite a broad uh, question: is are there any are there are there other interest rate benchmarks, for example, Euribor, Euro, 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 that are likely to be reformed in the future? So we talked about our webinar today was around LIBOR. Now, there are other eyeballs out there. So, Pericles, maybe if you want to take this one as a final question. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll start with the specifics. Euribor, definitely yes. Uh, the ECB has been very clear on their intentions. So, they reformed Euribor in order to keep with IOSCO principles compliance. But you may have seen the whole consultation about including Euro SDR based fallbacks into Euribor. So, yes, we, we have no idea of terms of timelines. But we can expect that uh, uh, something may uh, at some point change with Euribor. We're seeing the same in other jurisdictions. And again, I don't want to cast the net too wide. But whenever it comes to IBORs, we experience some sort of uh, process. Some of you may be familiar uh, that uh, the, the SARB in South Africa is going through a process of uh, reforming Jaibar. Uh, Sama in Saudi Arabia is in the process of uh, reforming cyber. Uh, we have seen obviously reform in terms of the Canadian and the Australian interbank offered rates. Um, so some 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 jurisdictions we've already seen a reform of the local IBORs. Others we may expect that in the future and your IBOR indeed is something to, to keep an eye on. But thankfully no, it's not something imminent. I think we're done here uh, in terms of the questions. Um, so on behalf of the bank, I would like to thank both of you gentlemen. It's been, it's been a great conversation. We can go on and on about it. Maybe I can take a closing remark. What, what, what is your mot de la fin 
if I can call it that way, you know, closing your mouth very close. That's the hardest question of the day, <laughs> Come here. <laughs> I, be prepared, be proactive. Uh, Jean-Éric mentioned that active transition is something that you need to consider. Uh, it's something that is happening. There's no more doubt about it. So let's all work together to make the financial system a more robust and resilient space. Thanks. Yeah. If you read from the LMA, we are about to get in the what they call the end game, and that's pretty much it. There's no running away from this. This is a, it's not a fight actually, it's more a collaborative exercise. And I think uh, provided that we all understand which direction we are meant to be heading, I actually am looking forward to engaging with, uh, with the market towards the uh, closing final chapter of what is, as Eric has said, probably one of the hardest challenges faced by financial markets for, for the past generations. So it's, it's going to be a big challenge, but at the same time, it's going to be, it's going to be something good. You're going to certainly have a lot of work on your end in the next few months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our webinar. Again, very informative. Uh, I think it's been beneficial for, for the clients of the bank or, or whoever attended the webinar. I just want to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded. We're going to, we're going to have our, our highlights reel on our social media platforms. And we are also going to post something on our on our landing page. So I highly encourage everyone to go and visit the landing page. There is a comprehensive list of FAQs that can help uh, clear out any doubts on the transition. So thank you again. Thank you, Pericles. Thank you, Jean-Éric, for your contributions today. And I look forward to chatting to you again on some other forum. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invite. Thanks. <laughs>